This is BBC One Southwest, and now Spotlight with Teresa Driscoll and Russell Labby. Police get tough over tractor tailbacks. Near misses, fishermen confront the Navy. And the man who tapes the test card. Some people's local news programmes tend to concentrate on hospital closures, B roads, and tractor legislation. An IRA booby trap explodes shortly after a woman soldier is shot. In Northern Ireland, between the late 60s and the late 90s, there was a distressingly high probability that the lead story would involve petrol bombs or Kalashnikovs instead. Far be it from me to relate the whole history of the Troubles for the sake of a documentary about television, and that's assuming you're generous enough to call this a documentary in the first place. But to not mention them at all, to pretend that Ulster Television's remit differed in no way from, say, TSW's, would be both dishonest and a disservice to the company. And yes, of course, to live in Northern Ireland in the latter half of the 20th century was categorically not all harrowing dread all the time. The province shouldn't be seen entirely through the prism of the Troubles. But you can hardly pretend they didn't happen either, especially when the actual subject is the history of a television company that had to broadcast in the midst of them. The intersection of honesty and history means you'll be hearing the letters IRA a lot more than IBA in this episode. The good news is, as the 30 years of all-out conflict recedes further into the past and a generation born after the Good Friday Agreement matures into adulthood, it's become increasingly less the case that the Troubles are the first thing that come to mind when you picture Ulster in your head. The ITA first advertised for a Northern Irish franchise in late 1958. The Troubles as we understand them hadn't officially started yet, although this was the middle of the IRA's Operation Harvest, which had taken out a BBC transmitter in Derry, among other things. Two consortia bid for the licence, one headed by the Duke of Abercorn, played here by an ageing Hitler and supported by the Belfast Telegraph, and one headed by the Earl of Antrim, played here by a friendly ghost and supported by the newsletter, and for some reason... Laurence Olivier. Just as with ATV three years earlier, and Yorkshire ten years later, the ITA eventually convinced the rivals to merge their bids together, which would make a great ironic metaphor, except that they were both led by Unionist Protestants, so it wasn't that hard of an ask. In fact, that being the case, the ITA added the extra condition that a decent stake in the new company should be offered to Catholic interests. Already we're in a bit of a weird area. The new company called itself Ulster Television Limited, which is incidentally a slight misnomer as the traditional province of Ulster consists of nine counties, three of which are actually in the Republic. But since very few people care about that in this day and age other than maniacs, we'll move on. It opened with ruthless efficiency just over a year after the initial franchise offer, slightly dramatically on Halloween. In 1959. Here's the opening eye dent. For the first but not the last time, Ulster's eye dent is unusual, to say the least. This symbol was actually the result of a competition in the local press, and the winner for the record was a Mr Roy Irwin of Ballycarry, and his logo would come to define the region for the next 34 years. The dots represent the major towns and cities of the six counties that make up the province, all joined together by the magic of televisual transmission. For some mad reason, the accompanying jingle has been arranged what sounds like a child's music box, resulting in a bizarre lullaby that's peculiarly unsettling, 
in the same way that a porcelain doll singing Ring a Ring a Rosie while its head turns 180 degrees to look at you is genuinely terrifying. This ident served Ulster Television through the first 10 years of its existence. By the end of the decade, colour television had arrived. Unfortunately, so had the Troubles. Much of that first decade had represented a relatively quiet period in Northern Ireland's history. Operation Harvest was a wash, an unpopular idea in the first place. It resulted in 18 men dead, mostly on the IRA side, and over 500 locked up to no net gain, very much the terrorist equivalent of the Gallipoli Offensive. The consequent storm of internal squabbling had the side effect of providing relative peace and quiet for a few years in the province, as the IRA were kept busy fighting each other instead of the English, Protestants and or innocent bystanders. This obviously couldn't last. Some estimates of the troubles starting in 1966 with the formation of the Ulster Volunteer Force and their almost immediate declaration of war on the still squabbling IRA. If you do choose to start from there, then the next three years was very much a phony war phase, marked by marches, bad blood, and the occasional isolated outbreak of violence. The whole thing inevitably exploded into all-out civil war on the streets in 1969. The spark that lit the powder keg was an eruption of violence in the Bogside, one of the most deprived areas in Derry City, or London Derry, name your poison. What started out as largely non-sectarian civil rights related rioting quickly developed with the help of the uniquely heavy-handed Royal Ulster Constabulary into a battlefield. By the time the British Army had been called in to back the RUC up it was clear this was not your average civil disturbance. Before long the IRA had re-emerged initially in two flavours with the explicit mission to wage armed struggle against the occupying British, and also each other, and also the Loyalists. Northern Ireland was now at war. So how does television operate in wartime? Well, of course, the last time it happened, it hadn't. But then there were very few parallels between this war and the last. For a start, that one had involved countries, not paramilitary organisations. For a second, World War II wasn't fought in our streets outside of the Channel Islands. Ulster Television weren't just broadcasters during wartime, but during a war fought on their own doorstep, often literally. And the third big difference? This was a terror war, a guerrilla war. There were three sides and only one was a real army. Although you did have your barricades and your no-go areas, this wasn't just a case of two enormous armies lined up against each other struggling for terrain. The paramilitaries were looking to conquer mental territory as much as physical, to exhaust or even scare one another and all the British off the island altogether. And when not doing so, to hide in plain sight. They weren't equipped for full-scale, perpetual conflict, hence the attacks coming in irregular bursts. They could come anywhere, at any time, and did. While in between, life carried on as normal, or as close to possible as normal, under the circumstances. Ulster Television weren't helped by the fact that they were technically the regional franchise of a national network. A national network for a foreign country even, as far as the IRA were concerned. They quickly developed a sort of broadcasting schizophrenia, perfecting the art of changing faces at the drop of a hat, because you never knew what was around the corner. It wasn't as if every news report was a relentlessly harrowing exercise in body counts. Nine times out of ten, life was reasonably normal. Around this time, Ulster became the first ITV station to institute hour-long daily local news programmes. Not because there was so much more news, but because what there was 
tended to fall on the depressing side of things, and so they needed the extra half hour for uplifting human interest stories, actively battling against the province's bleak, war-torn image. Even so, there was no way of telling when something terrible would happen, and Ulster Television had to be prepared for some pretty bleak circumstances, while at the same time providing the national ITV service. There could be a news flash about a bombing, probably only a few miles at most from the viewer's doorstep, and then Coronation Street of the Century came on. Such necessary cognitive dissonance kept Ulster Television going through the height of the Troubles. Its madness kept it sane. The corresponding ident, introduced when colour came to the region at the same time as the Troubles, erred on the side of caution by being silent and still. This wasn't an unusual thing for an ident to be at the time, of course, but it was particularly sensible in this particular time and place. In 1980, Ulster Television celebrated their 21st birthday. Again, I don't know why the 21st was so important to television channels, besides being the traditional age of adulthood. But whatever the reason, to mark the occasion, Ulster created a special ident. Presumably they couldn't be bothered to wait four years for the actual silver anniversary. Fair enough. This is in fact the last of only three model-based idents ever used on the ITV network. The others, of course, being the Golden Hind and the Anglian Knight, but obviously you knew that already, assuming you've been paying attention. While those two were made of genuine sterling silver, this was actually made with melted-down, otherwise unusable celluloid. How economical. And they even gave it a tune for the first time in a decade. One of those slightly squelchy synth melodies that were everywhere in those days. If you went up to someone in the street and said, Ulster Television, there's a good chance this ident would be the first thing they have thought of. There's a better chance it would be some variation on the fight or flight response, but this would be high on the list as well. The logo on a stick, or lollipop as it was also nicknamed, may only have been created as a birthday treat, but for whatever reason it stuck around after the celebrations, ultimately lasting for the bulk of the 80s. True, it wasn't exactly sombre, but then it wasn't necessarily seen all the time. Ulster had used InVision continuity since day one, and in fact still do to this very day, the only television station in the United Kingdom to do so. As with many stations, their announcers were often also their newsreaders, and at close down they were both, as Ulster chose to end every day's broadcasting with a rundown of the headlines, which again could often be less than conducive to a good night's sleep. And with only a few minutes to go until the UVF deadline and Mr. Donegan's life passes, there's still no word from the gang holding him. The announcers, therefore, had to be able to act both as avuncular lynx men and women and stone-faced information providers equally well. Some were better with than some others. Rain, but also some sunny spells. That's all the news tonight. The most notable Ulster IVC man is almost certainly Julian Simmons, who started off way back in 1981. Simmons started out visibly nervous and mannered, sometimes so stiff as to be almost animatronic. But now it's the return of Bruce Forsyth with Play Your Cards Right. And always desperately uncomfortable in particular in the news role. Down's opponents in the All-Ireland semi-final will be Offaly. They retained their Leinster title in a cliff-hanging finish against Leash. But after he was freed from that, he was able to loosen up in general. And loosen up, he certainly did. Finally able to be his own self on screen, he became the Ian Sterling of the Six Counties. A casual, conversational presence on screen. He eventually developed two shticks all of his own. The Santa Flashes, a Christmas tradition now 
in Northern Ireland, wherein he turned the links between programmes on Christmas Eve into an ongoing update on the nocturnal progress of Mr K Kringle. Fast asleep in bed no later than two hours before Santa's sleigh appears in the sky over their home. The new massive... Arguably even more famous, however, is his now legendary technique for introducing Coronation Street, which is basically to do so in the manner of nine fishwives, eight pantomime dames and Dick Emery all rolled into one. But now on the UTV we weren't rare to the likes of it, for Tracy Barlow has pulled David Platt up them stairs and snogged the whole face off him, and him still not fully formed yet, and now she wants another man. Has somebody put something in her tea for to get her up to a whole frenzy on Coronation Street? He still does both to this day, notwithstanding a bit of time off for a quadruple bypass, and it can be genuinely terrifying to watch his transformation from straightforwardly avuncular continuity announcer to mad elemental god of heat magazine. At nine o'clock. But now on the UTV, who needs Dracula and Frankenstein when you've monster liar Scylla Battersby? She's about to make sure Les and Yana spend Christmas Eve in a bath of mushy peas with not a dolly on the two of them. Imagine cold mushy peas all round all belonging to you on a nippy night like that. Try saying that after you've been at the Kirk and Sherry. Stay with us for Coronation Street. His weapons-grade campness is divisive, to say the least, but personally, and bearing in mind that I don't have to watch him every day, I think the world is more interesting with than without him. Anyway, back to the 80s, which now I think about it is a pretty good slogan for this entire decade. Around 1986 or so, the news started being introduced by its own ident integrated into the title sequence. This was also occasionally extracted and used as a main ident in place of the lollipop when something particularly awful happened. Of course, in 1989, ITV knocked on the various regions' doors with their generic look. And this is what was under the cloche for Ulster. I get the feeling that this was one of the last variants to be put together, and that the designers have basically just given up completely on their triangle conceit. I mean, how hard would it have been to put some of the prongs in there? In the end, it wasn't relevant, because Ulster inevitably turned it down flat. To be fair, it probably wouldn't have been politically advisable to adopt a British TV station's identity, even if it had been any good from a design point of view. Besides, they'd just replaced the telly on a stick the year before, with the obligatory Channel 4 influenced CGI gubbins. Fairly typical stuff for 1988. The animation on the logo itself is very nice, which is more than can be said for the company name Formup, which can be politely described as rudimentary. The squiggly lines have now been abstracted to the point where Mr. Roy Irwin's original intent is completely gone, but that'll happen after 30 years. I would also point out that because of the colour scheme, if you look at it long enough, it turns into a big capital S. Pause it and see. See? You can't unsee it now, can you? The real problem is the music, a discordant wailing electronic piece that I think is supposed to sound like bagpipes? Not the best idea in itself, and then there's the way it just cuts out at the end, which is disconcerting to say the least. This ident saw Ulster through to the 1990 Broadcasting Act and its concomitant franchise round. Northern Ireland wasn't expected to be a hotly contested region. And financially speaking, it wasn't, but Ulster was still taken by surprise by facing two noticeably richer rival bids in TVNI and Lagan Television, both of whom ended up outbidding Ulster Television's reasonably conservative 1.1 million. However, TVNI were found to have overbid at 3 million, and Lagan failed the quality threshold, whatever that means. So Ulster survived, despite coming dead last. And they entered the brave new post-broadcasting act world, looking ahead. 
1993, six months after the New Look ITV made its debut, Ulster did the same, initiating a major revamp of the station, one that insisted on its identity as a channel in its own right. Just to underline how big this was, they even changed the name. Goodbye Ulster Television, hello UTV. Wow, crikey, gosh, blimey, new, great, yeah! The newly rechristened UTV, or as Julian Simmons tends to call it, Deu TV, was brash, colourful, and most importantly, very much its own beast. In this new post-broadcasting act landscape, even the newbie likes of Meridian and West Country seemed somehow resigned from the start to their eventual buying out. UTV, on the other hand, was extraordinarily confident. And the new ident was very special indeed. Its objects flying through space again, but this time less Channel 4 and more Sky. Because Sky's idents at the time, when we got to see them, felt twice as futuristic as an iPhone app that hurled banknotes into your face. They'd taken the CGI objects trope and built on it, adding textures and backdrops and the odd genuinely filmed piece, to make them seem impossibly organic and extra special, which they needed to be, considering you were paying extra for them. The 1993 UTV ident, with its backlight and fluttering flag motif did much the same thing. The music was much improved as well, although that wouldn't have been terribly difficult. It's clearly and obviously Irish for one thing, and contains not one, but two catchy hooks. This slightly supermarketish look lasted for three years before being retired in favour of a set of idents making use of the Northern Irish landscape, a theme that would stay with UTV until the present day. The motif of zooming in for a closer look is a good idea, preventing the idents from becoming just picture postcards with a logo on top. If you must do live action idents, this is probably how to do it. The only problem is the UTV logo at the end is so blurry and indistinct, it's like the zoom has somehow made your eyes water. Meanwhile, the music has probably sensibly been reduced in length to just the closing riff. Which we're coming to play in a set of supplementary idents featuring local musicians tootling it out on various instruments. These were finally replaced themselves by the end of the century with a simple letterbox motif. By now, the troubles were finally winding to something resembling a close. The various sides were finally sitting down to talks, and after a couple of false starts... The leadership of the IRA have decided that as of midnight August 31st, there will be a complete cessation of military operations. Dicks. On Good Friday 1998, with nanoseconds to spare, an agreement was reached that effectively ended the troubles as we understand them. The IRA agreed to cease fire, disarm and ultimately disband. The British Army withdrew. The RUC were dismantled and replaced with the PSNI. And the Northern Irish Assembly was established at Belfast under strict power-sharing rules. There was some resistance among a few holdout wankers, but it turns out that slaughtering dozens of blameless bystanders actually does your cause more harm than good and the few holdout dickhead splinter groups, such as the real IRA and the presumably equally real UFF, have mostly concentrated on killing each other since the turn of the century. Finally, a bright new day was dawning in Northern Ireland, and UTV made the most of it. New millennium, 
new logo. Roughly the same jingle though, at least at first. As before, the items themselves were arguably subordinate to the logo. At first, they kept the picturesque look at your region theme, before going through a keep an eye on four screen touching phase from 2002. Of course, while all this was going on, over in England we were being treated to the ITV generic look, except in Carlton run regions where we got a slightly different generic look. However, the Harps managed to pass the province by completely. Still self-owned and under no obligation whatsoever to either Britain or ITV, they never adopted it, and never looked like adopting it. Unfortunately, when the patronising, region-negating, celebrity-faced identities arrived in 2002, they were overruled, and forced to adopt them. UTV responded to this in the same way as Channel, by replacing the ITV logo with their own, and almost exclusively using their faces rather than ITVs. And then by dropping them all together at the first opportunity and going back to landscapes, this time in the form of picture postcards. Somewhat less exciting perhaps, but at least it was their own. The backdrop changed in 2009 and the theme in 2011 to some fairly Route 1 U-based wordplay. The jingle's back though. And of course by now they were a big deal. Around the turn of the century they bought several radio stations in the Republic and a few in Britain, until they became plump enough to stretch out beyond the shores of Erin and buy out the Wireless Group, which owns TalkSport, one of the bigger commercial stations in Britain. They earned extra brownie points when they immediately fired Kelvin McKenzie on general principles. UTV Radio was a go, and soon the abbreviation had become the company's official name, their reach having spread far beyond Ulster. Thanks in part to the rise of digital television, UTV has for several years now been viewable in the Republic as well as the province shoving the divisiveness of the Troubles firmly into the past where it belongs. They also branched out into the communications market, launching UTV Talk, now UTV Connect, again in the whole of Ireland, and even their own ISP, UTV Internet. Talking of which, they're very grateful to the islands of Tuvalu for releasing their top-level domain worldwide, because it's resulted in their claiming the best URL ever. U dot TV. And at the start of this year, they launched UTV Ireland in the Republic. It hasn't caught on so far, but it's neat that it exists. UTV Media is now one of only three companies to run an ITV franchise, and the only one to own just a single one of them. Unique among the ITV franchisees, UTV was neither bought out by a rival, nor did it buy a rival out. It's probably the closest thing we'll get to a real happy ending in this series. We got it out of Northern Ireland. Funny how things work out sometimes.
But now on the UTV as Jack Duckworth prepares to move out of his house, what is he going to do with Big Vera's ashes? Should he take them to Connie's house? Will Connie want to give Big Vera's ashes house room? Well, wait till I tell you, she better. Or Big Vera will be giving her a severe dig in the bake from beyond the grave in Coronation Street. <laughs> 